Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and this is a show all about board games and especially the people who play them. It is the middle of the summer. Summer things are happening. Summer movies are going on. Summer releases are being announced right and left. There's really a lot of exciting things going on, and it's a great time to be a board gamer because there's all kinds of cool new games to play, as well as the fantastic games that have always existed, and you can play those. Um, we're still having some internet problems here at the house, at the studio, so I will be doing a Q&A again tonight, later, probably around 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, and I'll answer questions and stuff from my house where the internet connection is good. But we should hopefully have that resolved soon. Well, um, other than that, a lot of exciting things to look forward to this week, but let's get started with the news. Well, in news, I do want to remind you that the Dice Tower Cruise registration is alive and well. If you've never been on the Dice Tower Cruise, which we did last year, it is a fantastic time where we get together, play games. It is a marvelous vacation. We have some incentives. If you get other people to come, you can also get extra games. And you're going to get games just for showing up on the cruise. A fantastic time. You can find more information about that at DicetowerCruise.com. But let's get to the news here. First of all, Ninja Division, they're best known for probably uh, working with just different games. Um, uh, Super Dungeon Explorer, probably the most well-known. They have a game called Rainbow Knights, where you're going to be making rainbow trails around the board. It's a speed dexterity game. It's aimed at kids, but it looks cool. I like the artwork, so I have high hopes for this one. Uh, there's a Not Alone expansion coming. This is a one-verse-all type game, and this one just has more cards, more locations, more stuff. This is coming out later this year. WizKids in 2018 is going to be releasing a pre-painted miniature thing for kids um, with animal companions, and it's kind of they get kids into role-playing and miniatures, which sounds interesting. We'll have to see how that works. Speaking of miniatures, Privateer Press is now uh, going to have a, you know, you get those game boxes. Like, I just got the first Hasbro subscription party box. Well, this is one but with miniatures. And so each month you get a miniature that shows up, which seems odd, but I guess if you like to paint miniatures and want cool miniatures, this would be a cool way to do that. Last week, of course, they always announce it when Board Game Breakfast goes up, but the Spiel des Jahres, the winners were announced. So the Spiel des Jahres, the biggest uh, gaming award in Germany, went to... King Domino by Bruno Catala from Blue Orange Games. This tile laying game, very simple. Not my favorite, but a lot of people like it. I'm very much in a minority on this one. And then the uh, Kenner Spiel, which is more of a strategy game, that winner went not to Terraforming Mars, which a lot of people thought it would, but went to the Exit the Game series, which I'm very excited about because I really like these games, and this means there's going to be a whole lot more of them coming out, I'm sure. Uh, Raxon is a game that's been making waves all over the internet because they're doing a bit of a viral marketing campaign for it. It's from Plat Hat Games. It's set in the Dead of Winter universe, and, and in fact, our very own Roy Kennedy did a review of it last week, so if you want to see what the game is. But to get the game, like, they send the game out to some people, and then those people give invitations to other people where they can buy the game. It reminds me very much of how Gmail first was uh, dis distributed. So anyway... I'm not sure if there's going to be actual regular distribution, if it's going to show up in stores or not. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Mayfair has announced a couple new games. Run Bunny Run, which is a one verse all game, kind of a cutesy where everyone's chasing a rabbit. And then Food Chain. This is from Kevin Nunn, and this is where basically you're going to be revealing cards each turn and different things, different creatures are going to be eating other things. I like the concept of this. Kevin Nunn has done a game like this before. Uh, so this one sounds good. Uh, five Minute Dungeon, which is a successful Kickstarter, is now picked up by Spin Master, and you're going to be able to find this at Target starting very, very soon. Simon has announced a new game coming out called Gang Rush Breakout. Some sort of dice rolling, and you pick the actions with a 3D board. Since, considering how soon this is coming out, I'm surprised I didn't hear Heidner tell of this one at the Simon Expo a few months ago. Uh, but who knows? It looks cool. 
Um, and then finally, IDW and Nickelodeon uh, are working together to bring out Splat Attack, which is going to have lots of Nickelodeon cartoons from the 90s. We got Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, uh, what were the other ones that came out that time? SpongeBob, uh, different things like that. So is the game itself going to be any good? It's about a big food fight. I'm assuming no, but you never know. That's the regular news. Let's go over to Suzanne for our kickstarting news. Happy breakfast, everybody. As the ramp up to Gen Con gets going, there is still a bunch going on in the crowdfunding world for gamers. So let's get going. White Wizard is bringing Star Realms back to Kickstarter with their Star Realms Frontier campaign. There's actually a number of separate pieces in this campaign that you can pledge for separately or together. For those of you unfamiliar with Star Realms, this is a sci-fi deck building game that has you building up a fleet from a shared random market and working to gain faction synergies so that you can knock your opponent out. The New Frontiers expansion plays one to four players and is a standalone game set of Star Realms, but it's also completely compatible with the original game. The Stellar Allies expansion has 12 new cards with a mix of factions included. And there are six new command decks that let you play as a legendary commander. Commanders create asynchronous player setups with different health and abilities between the commander and their custom Gambit power cards. Also, there's a Kickstarter exclusive command deck called The Lost Fleet. Already a hugely funded campaign, a bunch of promos have been unlocked as stretch goals, and because of the variety of offerings, the pledge levels and add-ons vary, but at its simplest, you can get Frontiers for a pledge of $20 plus shipping, all the way up to the $65 Commander tier that includes everything new in the campaign. Ink Monsters is a light and quick drafting and set collection game in which players are competing for the most points by nabbing the best monsters from an open style draft. The cards are laid out in a ring and each has different abilities and characteristics that impact scoring and other gameplay elements. Action cards help you maneuver the pen around the ring of monsters, letting you take the monsters you want or try to wrangle your opponents into taking monsters with negative effects. Designed by Daryl Andrews of Sagrada fame and co-designer Erica Bioris, Ink Monsters is cute and engaging with really great monster art, and it can be yours for a pledge of just $20 plus shipping. Who Goes There is a mostly cooperative game of survival based on the story that inspired the classic movie The Thing. To win, you need to survive and stay human until you get rescued by the helicopter. Trust each other to survive, but someone may not be what they seem. Try not to venture outside too much, plan for food rounds, work together and trade to build tools and upgrade them, but watch your back. Going outside is necessary, but risky, because there are great bonuses out there, but there are many, many dangers as well. And if you encounter the thing, you could get a strike or become infected. And then you can work to infect other survivors as they sleep. Players take on the roles of different characters, all of whom have different abilities, and can also gain experience points in order to gain additional abilities. The game does a great job of being thematic, with a nice dose of humor and great illustration style throughout. The base game of Who Goes There plays up to four, but the campaign has a bunch of different pledge options, including a level that expands the game up to six players. You can get a base copy of Who Goes There for a pledge of $59. Beasts of Balance is back with a new expansion called Beasts of Balance Battles. Beasts of Balance was a successful campaign over a year ago for a game that creatively combined a physical dexterity game with a digital app. You're going to stack animals on top of a base, and that influences the world that's animated in the app. This new expansion adds an entirely new mode of play in which two to three players go head-to-head -head playing elemental gods. Creatures now get defense and attack stats, and tumbling the stack damages your creatures only, and the artifacts have different abilities too. On top of that, there are battle cards that have a wide range of powers, and these are chipped too, so they also work with that electronic sensory base. Battles also includes three new standard animals, the anglerfish, chameleon, and flamingo. And there's a new type of beast, the legendary beast. And the first one in this line is the grumpy dragon that will help you out as long as you can feed it. Beast of Balance has a stunning visual style and the toy factor is off the charts for this project. You can get the Battles expansion for $49 plus shipping. And there are a number of optional add-ons on top of that. Or if you need the base game, you can pick that up too among the mini pledge level packs. 
The massive Gloomhaven is a huge hit, and now there's a sibling game on Kickstarter called Founders of Gloomhaven, which tells the story of the evolving countryside before Gloomhaven grew. Players take on the role of a specific race, each of which has its own abilities and strengths. This is a tile lane and action management game, and even though it's competitive, there's a bit of collaboration that happens because as you place resource tiles, you can create larger and more productive resource units based off of what opponent's tiles you connect to. Players will develop and deliver resources on the board by using their action cards. Action cards allow you to place tiles, improve your deck with new cards, upgrade to advanced resources, or placing buildings to help gain control of the board. And after you take an action, each card has a follow action that your opponents get to take advantage of. And when you need your cards back, you call a vote, which also provides income to your opponents and a vote about a prestige building, which can net a lot of endgame points. You can get a copy of Founders of Gloomhaven for a pledge of $49. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hello, Chaz Marler from Paradise Paradise here with a confession for you about an ugly bias that I recently discovered that I have. I hate squares. Let me explain. Even though they interpolate, squares still make me hesitate. That's why I tend to sulk playing Descent or Space Hulk. It is an unwieldy bear to play a map based upon a square. The familiar traditional cubic angle makes it hard to calculate diagonal. I'd abstain from the others if I had my druthers. And douse the lights on the starkness of the grid in massive darkness. Ever since I was a kid, when I played Battletech, boards with square spaces left me a wreck to me a playing field that is nice is one that's pre-measured and precise the only thing that's crueler than squares is to measure with a ruler and rolling 10,000 dice still don't make warhammer nice and to this day necromunda makes me politely decline nah and my dreams of playing guild ball are a measured goal i won't reach it all and the concept of movement trays they simply make my eyes glaze needing rulers to rule ice and fire is leaving me inches from desire without six sides to every map space a game's gonna fall flat on its face every other map is just a derision give me a board with hexagon precision mansions of madness second edition made its very own maddening decision to use tile split into strange divisions guess i'll pass until its third revision so even though it perplexes i keep coming back Two hexes. The tile shape that has people raven. Want some proof? Just ask Gloomhaven. That's why to this day I still go ape for the overproduced masterpiece. That's Heroescape. Yeah, that's right. Let my board game lexicon start and end with the hexagon. Okay, so from the Dice Tower this week, we're going to be reviewing quite a few games. All of us are going to be taking a look at Dice Forge. I'm going to be taking a look at games like All In, Ghost Love Candy, Cookie Box, Wordsy, Quingo. Um, and I'll be taking a look at the Too Many Bones. That's a big giant game. And you will also have the playthroughs coming up this week of our latest time stories. Of course, they're going to be spoiler filled, so don't watch them if you want to know how we, we got through or didn't get through. Either way. Um, and then other things are going to be coming up this week. I'm going to be starting a new series on uh, Monopoly and Life. Basically, it's called 10 Games to Replace Monopoly or 10 Games to Replace Life. 
And in this, I'm talking about these games and I'm not actually beating up on Monopoly in life. I'm just saying, hey, if you like Monopoly or don't like Monopoly, here's other games that might be a good alternative. So maybe you know someone who loves with life, you'll be able to send them to this and they can find games that are similar to that. So series I said, it started at the beginning of the year and now it's here. All right. Well, that's what is coming up this week from the Dice Tower. Of course, uh, podcasts and things from DiceTowerNetwork.com. All the podcasts are the network. Definitely check them out. Hello, everyone. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Natter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Insider. Now, Insider is a social deduction game in a small box. So let me show you a little bit about the game and why I like it. So here you have the whole game itself. You have a deck of cards, some commons that you'll distribute to some players, along with one player being a master and the other player being an insider. After you shuffle your cards, you'll go ahead and distribute the roll cards. Whoever is the master will turn over their card. The master will shuffle the deck. When everyone's eyes are closed, they will split the deck and figure out what word they will say. The master will close their eyes, then the insider will open their eyes, and they will go ahead and look at that one word. The master will hide that word, and then tell everyone to open their eyes. You grab the timer, then you flip it, and then you have that much time to figure out what the word is. You can simply ask the master yes or no questions. If no one gets the word in that time, then everyone loses. If everyone figures out who the insider is, then everyone wins besides the insider. If everyone gets the word and they don't guess the insider, then the insider wins. So as you can see, the insider is a fairly simple game to understand and introduce to new gamers. What I really enjoy about this game is the fact that it's not heavy set on social deduction. Yes, you're trying to figure out who the insider is, but you're also trying to figure out what the word is. And if you are the insider, you're trying to kind of guide people towards that direction without getting caught. And that's more or less what I really enjoy about the game because it's not focused on just everyone else and who done it or who knows it, but it's also focused on what is that word. So that's why I really enjoy the insider. Well, thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. All right, so this week on Nick. the thrift store th throat... Nick. What? What? I did something to you. What'd you do? We're in the middle of an intro. I bought a game. Well, that's good. We need <sighs> games to review. I went over budget, bro. Uh, but how much? Like 20 times over budget, dude. 20 times yeah. over budget? Yeah, we were going to have explosions next week. We need that money. We're not going to have that. Nope. Nope. What Damn thrift it. store were you at? Were you in like Beverly Hills? I wasn't, dude. I went to the Disney convention. We got to play it. What? It, what is it even? Dude. 20,000 leagues under the sea, check it. Can well, we play it? Play no, it. we can't review it. It's not from a thrift store. I want to play it. So? Come on, there's boats and intrigue and stuff. Oh my god. I need to be a captain. Fine, we spent all this money. You oh, might as well. Captain, my you god. Ruined next week. Okay, so this is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a game in which we're going to be trying to race our Nautiluses around the board to get safely into our home port before we get sunk. You're going to be rolling around, but the problem is, as you can see, all of these gunboats on the board can actually move around like so. So you are always in danger of being sunk, just like this one would have been right now. So how do we not get sunk? Well, these are submarines after all. So if we land on one of these spaces with the wheel, we can do what I just did here and move the gunboats around, or you can choose to go underwater and submerge. And you identify it by splitting your boat in half, putting it down. Now gunboats will just slide right over you. The downside is you're going to be moving slower with a D3 because submarines don't go as fast underwater. You can still be sunk if you're on a depth charge and a boat passes over you if you're submerged, but otherwise you are safe. And the first person in the center wins. So that was 20,000 leagues on the MCs. Not not ten nine nine nine. I will forgive Mike for spending an ungodly amount of money on this game because it was really fun. Like the fun in the game is in the gimmick. Like it's yeah. ultimately one giant gimmick of like the things spinning and they're like knocking each other. And there's like not much strategy, but it's a great gimmick. Yeah, it's a good game. There's a little bit of press your luck, you know. So it takes just a roll and move up a level, and it's a really cool shelf piece. That's our thoughts on Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Great film. Good game. Please do check us out on all forms of social media, which is right here. 
Um, please let us know what you're playing. Send us pictures of stuff you found at thrift stores. We'd yeah. love to see that kind of stuff. And until next time, we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. I want you underwater more like. <laughs> Who won the contest? Who's getting a D&D player's handbook? Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Swords podcast, and welcome to Role Playing. Before we get into the meat of this week's episode, I uh, just want to let know that not Cat won the contest, so I'll be getting in contact with you to send you a free D&D 5th Edition Player's Handbook. Now that that's out of the way, I want to warn the rest of you that this episode's going to be a little math heavy, so most of you probably just want to uh, fast forward to the next segment. So just for reference, we had about 79 entries into the contest. So that's a large chunk of data. Using a dice roll of 3d8 plus 4 and a handy website I found called anydice.com, this is what you should get on a bell curve distribution. However, when I took the numbers that we rolled for the previous experiment, this is the distribution that we got. I want to point out this little guy right here. Someone said they rolled a one. That's not possible on uh, 3d8 plus four. Other interesting thing of note is if you look on this chart, nobody rolled anything higher than a 24. 79 different people rolled numbers, and yet there are five different numbers that were not rolled at all. So what does all this actually mean? Well, honestly, nothing. Did I miss anything? Did you see anything interesting in this data that I made? Well, let me know down in the comments below and make sure you subscribe to my channel to see other great RPG content. In the meantime, I'll see you next time and may all your hits hopefully be crits. So I was sitting around looking at the news that came out this week, looking at Raxon and Raxon the game is from Plat Hat Games. It's in their Dead of Winter universe. Raxon is very similar to Umbrella from Resident Evil. And if you go to the web page, it's like an alternate reality. They're nice guys. Of course, they're evil. You know, and, and the game, you can check out Roy's review of it, again, to learn more about the game. But I was interested in the viral marketing of this and how they, they, the game is out there. People have the game. And if you want to buy the game, you have to get an invite from someone who else has it. And each person who has it has three invites and they can send them out. This is almost identical to the marketing that Gmail used when it first showed up. And we were discussing this internally at the Dice Tower and also uh, in the Dice Tower, amongst Dice Tower network folk. And some debate about is this a good tactic or not. Now, from a marketing tactic, that's brilliant. It's really well done. And it's going to get people excited about the game. But I don't like it. Now... I like Plat Hat. I'm sure the game itself is fine. I'm sure I'll enjoy it. I'm not sure I like the, the tactic itself because it preys on people having something that other people don't have or being part of an exclusive club. Now, I know that's kind of how advertising works in general. Um, but I don't know that I... And, I, and then this isn't here. I'm not here to, to, to make this a speech against Plat Hat. I'm not. Uh, they're, they're a great company. Really like those guys. But this... At attitude that this fosters which also comes from kickstarters too where the kickstarters like get this game is one time only no one else will ever get this game or get these exclusives no one else will ever get them it brings out this attitude that i'm in on a secret i'm part of something cool and elite and you aren't or it's not so nefarious as that but it's like i'm part of this cool secret join me and I, and, I, and that worries me a little because it makes the person who's buying it, the consumer, become an advertiser for the product. And sometimes at the cost of whether they like the product or not. And it can make you like the product more. If I back a game on Kickstarter, and I think there's really, there's, there's truth to this, and I spend thousands of dollars for all the extras and everything, and that game comes in, I am probably bound to determine that this is a good game. Probably I already assume so from watching the Kickstarter um, you know, watching the, the videos and all the things. I'm like, okay, this looks really good. When it comes in, I'm like, I know it's good. I've invested in it. And then when I play it, I'm like, oh, maybe it's not so good. But am I willing to say that? Well, that's hard, right? You people should be willing to say that it's good. But if it's like, hey, I can get other people to get this too and be involved, they'll like it more. 
it almost reminds me of like the living card games and collectible card games. The more people I get to enjoy these games, the more people I have to play in. But I feel sometimes that we're saying things are cool and we're saying they're cool because of the thing that surrounds them, not because of the thing itself. Again, I know nothing about Rockstar. It might be an amazing game. I know nothing about many of these Kickstarters that come out. They might be amazing games, but I do know that people are like, I need you to back this game on Kickstarter. Why should I back it? Because if we go over this stretch goal, we're going to get more miniatures. Oh, well, that's just, you're just saying that as a selfish thing for you to get more stuff. I want to know, is the game good? And so, again, I'm not trying to stop this. This is an interesting campaign that they're running for this. And there's interesting Kickstarter campaigns that are run all sorts of things. But I think as a consumer, we need to be careful to, one, not foster this environment of like, hey, it's cool. Let's do this because it's cool. And if you're not doing it, you're not cool. Because here's the deal, folks. If I go to someone's house and they have a shelf of games that is this size only, am I a better gamer than them? I am not. It doesn't matter how many games you own. You can own no games and just play other people's games. I'm in here. I'm in this business to make gaming fun for everybody. And I'm not better than other people. And I'm always wary when any kind of thing crops into the scene where it's like, well, you don't know about that? <laughs> no, the whole point of the Dice Tower is to promote gaming to everyone. I have lots of really rare games. I have a few rare games, but if another game comes out that's better than my rare game, you better believe I'll drop that rare game. I'm not going to hang on to it because it's somehow better. I did that with Cosmic Encounter. I had a very expensive Mayfair version. I actually have that version again down here now for myself as a collector item, but when the new Fantasy Flight version came out, it was better. Did it, it, did it devalue the copy I had? Oh, definitely. Was I like, no, this one's better to keep the value up? No, I don't care about that sort of nonsense. I'm not better than anyone else who's playing games. We're just all having fun playing games. It's the whole point. Games are about education and, and other things, but they should mostly be about fun. And I'm not so sure there's always fun when I have someone in my ear going, if you don't have this, you're missing out. Well, am I? And I have to be careful that when someone's saying that, what's their goal? What's their reasoning for saying that? Is it to make themselves feel better about their own purchase? Is it because they get some sort of benefit if more people get involved in the game? I'm just saying that we should be wary of such things. But then again, I'd like to hear what you think. Tell me in the comments. Mike Delicio from Solo Mode Games. Today I want to talk a little bit about Kickstarter. Kickstarter, as you may know, is a crowdfunding uh, program where people can get their projects funded. And one of the uh, aspects of Kickstarter that we are probably most interested in is board gaming. One of the things that I have noticed is that I am much more likely to uh, fund a Kickstarter board game if it has a solo variant. Um, this is something that has been a little bit controversial because some people have stated that uh, these solo modes are being just added onto the project to gather more people and maybe they were not an organic part of the design process and they're maybe just being stuck on or added on at the very last moment to gather more people. Uh, and that is something that uh, obviously concerns me if that's true. Um, and I will say that one of the things that worries me a bit when I'm considering a board game kickstarting project is if the solo variant is a stretch goal um, or if you have a completed rule book and towards the end of the project they say, well, we're developing a solo variant and those rules will come after. Uh, that does raise a few red flags to me, but um, I will say that I still have backed projects where that has been the case. Uh, I took a look at my own history. I started uh, my first Kickstarter board game was in 2013 and I have so far uh, supported 41 projects and of those projects 24 of them had a solitaire variant so just over half uh, and I will say that as time has gone on I am much more aware of looking for a solo mode and hopefully one that was or it appears to be uh, something that was early on in the development process. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, if you are a solo gamer, does that play a big role into your decision-making process for 
backing a Kickstarter pro uh, project. If you are not a solo gamer, what are the things that you look for in a Kickstarter project? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much and have a great day. This week on What Should I Get, we have someone curious about which theme they think is the best Monopoly theme. Now, well, let's go ahead and find out. Hi, this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table. This is What Should I Get, where we go on the board game subreddit and we check out the daily personalized game recommendation post there that's posted there on a daily basis. We go ahead and recommend games for people. So, let's go ahead and start. Mr. T. Bacon is curious about which version of Monopoly they should go ahead and get. Now, my name is Dis already responded with the perfect answer, which is get whichever one works for your friends and family. Now, this opens up a whole new can of worms because what versions of Monopoly do exist? And the answer to that is a ton of stuff. But if you're really interested, there's a whole wiki on every single version that's ever been made, including custom fan ones, but I'll go over some basic general ones. Now, uh, Gary, if you can, just go ahead and post uh, some of the more obvious ones that uh, you could almost expect. Okay, I think that was enough time. Thank you, Gary. Okay, so no surprise there as we saw. And now with the following list, these ones absolutely make no sense in terms of one, why they exist, and two, what are you even doing in this game? So at Street Fighter, are you buying underground fighting rings? Is DIYopoly the print and play version? Now with Beaveropoly, 99% of the people that are buying this think that it's about beavers. It's about football. Why? 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 Zappos, you don't even have a physical store. Why do you need this? So with Christmas Story, I'm going to assume that you're buying poles as you go around the map and then hotels are replaced by children being stuck to those poles and then uh, getting a hotel is maybe getting one of the main characters from the story getting attached to your pole. That's the only thing I can see working with this theme. I actually have no problems with this one. I have, I might actually go buy this one right now. I'm T. Bacon. Going back to your original question, my name is just kind of nailed the hammer on nail there where you should just get whichever one fits your needs. But if you want some recommendations, some of my recommendations would be going with Pokemon Monopoly. I personally never played it myself, but I've heard Tropical Tycoon is a pretty good one. And also, if your friends really want to play Monopoly, but you don't want to play Monopoly, then get Monopoly Gamer. It's half not Monopoly. And that was another episode which I get. Be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendation post there that's posted on a daily basis. And this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying breakfast. Hi everyone. In three days, me and my family will be off to go camping in Austria for three weeks. And I think, oh, three days, it's time enough to do some packing. But my wife is a bit better at planning stuff. So she said, well, what about the garden? We don't want to come back to a garden that is basically a jungle. So of course she's always right. So today I'm working in the garden, cutting off stuff and I don't like working in the garden, but that's a different thing. This week I will probably have no time to play Cottage Garden. In Cottage Garden you are trying to fill up your garden and you do that by on your turn choosing one of the available Tetris shaped flower beds and put them on one of your gardens. If you have a empty hole you can fill it up with those cute cats and also there is this lovely wheelbarrow that comes with the game. Once one of your flower beds is perfectly filled up, you score points for it and you can get a new one. Cottage Garden is a very nice game. It has not been on the table that much and I don't think it will again because I feel the game Bear Park is filling its spot. It's doing much, a much nicer job in choosing the tiles that you really need and gives you more time to plan. So I think my wife loves that more than I do as well. Well, I am off for a vacation right now. Thank you for watching. I will be at Gen Con. Hope to see you there. Happy summer, everyone. Just a short, short dice, dice baby this time, this week, folks. This is a hex chest. This is from Elderwood Academy, and it's to hold your dice. Now, I guess most people would use a normal set of dice but I have here a couple of my double sixes. I believe this is a nine sided dice. This is a seven sided dice. I got a 20 sided and eight sided. And I don't know what this one is, 16 sided, right? But I tried different sizes. The lid fits on, it's magnetic. You can shake it around, you don't even hear the dice. And you can change the dice out. Nice, it's on Kickstarter now. You get different designs on the cover. I really like these. 
I like having my dice that I can carry around somewhere in a cool chest like this. That's that, Elderwood Academy. Cyril's Brettspiele is proudly presenting Yokohama, the best and the worst, Niels. And now we are going to Japan. My favorite part on Yokohama is the variety of uh, variability in this game. These cards are different here. These uh, extras are. Even the places are completely different and the scoring goals are completely different. Each single location can be like in Istanbul on a different area next turn than the extra cards. It is an, almost an endless, uh, an infinite number of possibilities so each single game is guaranteed unique and I should mention right now this is my game right now of 2017 so far my favorite game so far and therefore it has only a tiny little issue that is easy to fix however let me show it to you here these contracts or so-called orders, they have different values like nine victory points and an import for five different goods. Uh, the next one has even 11 for six goods. The next one has nine and an import for six goods. And then there are this ones here for four goods, you get only two victory points, a dollar and an import. Or this one, you get one victory point and two dollars for four goods. So um, for newbies, it's not really easy to figure out which order is good. I mean, obviously, the higher the victory points, the better the uh, contract is. But sometimes it's hard to get the good ones. This was my favorite part of Yokohama uh, City in Japan. See you next week here on the Board Game Breakfast. My name is Niels and enjoy the rest of the show. Bye. So what's on the shelf this week? Well, first of all, we have Vegas Showdown, which is a great fun game about uh, building casinos. Really enjoy this one. Uh, I, I like the whole auctioning, and it's just fun to see your casino come to life. Vast, the Crystal Caverns. This is the most asymmetrical game I own. One person's a dragon, one person's a knight, one person's a thief, one person's a bunch of goblins, and one person's the cave itself, all having different goals. Among the Stars is a great drafting style game, very similar to Seven Wonders. Um, and Empty Space here, which should have a game in it. Carcassonne. This Carcassonne's fun. Uh, this is all my Carcassonne stuff. I have it in two boxes, Carcassonne and Carcassonne Wheel of Fortune, which you probably have never heard of. Um, but I have everything in between these two boxes. I might have a third box of Carcassonne somewhere. I haven't bought any expansions for a while. Sam's been covering those lately. Race for the Galaxy, an amazing game. Highly recommend it. Sheriff of Nottingham. Mean, it's, it's a card game. I like it best with two players. Sheriff of Nottingham. This is, of course, the first Dice Tower Essential game. The expansion is coming out at Gen Con, which is exciting. But... Very excited uh, always to play this one about lying and bluffing each other. And finally, a deluxe version of Pentago. This is, Pentago is a game about getting five in a row. On your turn, you drop a disc in or you rotate, and you rotate part of the board. And then very simple, but a lot of fun. And that, folks, is what's on the shelf this week. In a previous video, we talked about a wide range of games based on literary works. But there's a genre that I left out entirely. It's not because I forgot about it, it's because I knew we could fill a whole video just on that one genre. Comic books. Nice. Comic books have been around since the early 1900s, but it wasn't until the last quarter of the 20th century that anybody outside the industry really took them seriously. It wasn't until Art Spiegelman won a Pulitzer Prize for chronicling his father's Holocaust experience in the book Mouse that anyone thought that comic books were anything other than muscle-bound guys in tights punching bad guys in the face. Now the genre has matured, but the vast majority of titles on the market still are Cape Crusaders and Marvelous Mutants. So it's no surprise that when you're talking about games inspired by or based on comic books, you're talking about superhero games. From Spider-Man to Superman, every big league, heavy-hitting superhero has a vintage board game in his or her name, dating back decades. But the fact is, most of these are merchandising cash grabs, or really only worthy of nostalgic value. But in recent years, since the dawn of the 21st century, we've seen hobby game companies like Cryptozoic, Top Deck, Fantasy Flight, and more take a crack 
at superheroes. From licensed products like Marvel Legendary, the DC Comics Deck Builder, and more, to inspired products like Heroes of Metro City, Heroes Wanted, Sentinels of the Multiverse. One licensed game that transcends universes is Eric Lang's Dice Masters from WizKids. There are Marvel Dice Masters, DC Dice Masters, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Dice Masters, and they've expanded beyond the world of superheroes as well with Star Wars and more. But do they all work? From Cryptozoic, we've got DC Comics Deck Builder, and it throws all the DC heroes into the mix and creates a very chaotic, competitive game. Now, some people are gonna love the chaos created by Aquaman driving the Batmobile while he's twirling Wonder Woman's magic lasso out the window. But for me personally, that just doesn't feel right. Now, Marvel Legendary's deck builder game uses icons to encourage players to stick to cards that really work for their character. Now, I'm gonna close off with one comic book game that is vastly different from the rest that I've been talking about. Now, this game is not for everyone, but if you are a fan of logic puzzles of the Ted is wearing a blue sweater, Peter is wearing a green sweater, Mary is shorter than the person in the red sweater, so where is the turkey hiding his pants variety, then you're really gonna dig witness. So, did I forget to mention your favorite comic book inspired game? If so, tell me what the best superhero game out there is and post it in the comments below. Hello, my name's Dan and this is Cora and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of around five and under. And today, I'm gonna to be taking Cora's head off and putting it on the dog's body because today we're talking about this game. What is it, Cora? Muckapazza. Muckapazza. The theme of Muckapazza is rather odd. In the game, a group of animals from the planet Calpita have landed on Earth. However, while teleporting, somebody pressed the wrong button and now the heads, bodies and legs of the animals are all mixed up. It's a player's job to turn all the frodrankies and cockapretals back into the correct animals. Basically, it's a kid's board game version of the film The Fly. In the game, the players are going to be sliding around tiles, trying to make specific animals within three steps. Cora and I play the basic version, where a smaller board's used, and it's always possible to make the animal. However, for older kids, you can open a board up to double the size, and double the number of animals. And in this version, then making the animals not always possible, and there's an element of tactical play in trying not to leave your opponent in a good position for their next turn. Mukapaze is a very tactile game, and it's one that Cora really enjoys. We mentioned this game before on our top um, five games of all time, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, that mine? Yeah, this was your number one, wasn't it? Yeah. Mucka Pazza! Mucka Pazza! Why do you like that game? Because um, it's funny. Because it's funny? Yeah. Why is it funny? Because... <laughs> Just look at the box! Just look see? at the box! It's hilarious! Yeah! The dog's got the cat's head and the dog... <laughs> and the cat's got the dog's dead. It's anarchy. <laughs> Pure anarchy. So we give Mukapaza two space thumbs up. So recently, I witnessed a highly charged and rather loud agreesinment. An agreesinment is kind of like an argument, but it happens when two people loudly and violently both agree on the same thing. Like if two people get cut up by the same driver, or if two people discover that they both hate cats. It's kind of beautiful in its own way. Now these two people are just finished playing a game of the Castles of Burgundy, because they're just wild. And after tallying up the score, they found out it was a draw. Dun dun dun! Dramatic. Now, after consulting the rules, they were both equally outraged and went on to talk about this at length, which was great for everybody. They decided on the following things. A, that the game was broken, which it absolutely is not. B, that they should never play the game again, which I am actually fine with, if I'm honest. And C, 
Now, more games should have meaningful and decisive tiebreakers in them, which is probably true. But here's the thing. I don't care. It's amazing how many times you can play a game that's considered a point salad and tie on 153. But when that does happen with me, I kind of just shake hands and go, huh. But I'm probably in the minority. So let me know what games outrage you when they end in a tie and what some better tiebreakers would be. And I'll see you next week, you crazy kids. You. And that's another Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. I hope you all had a fantastic time. And if you like what these marvelous contributors are doing, and they are doing a fantastic job, tell them in the comments. Let people know their segments are great. I mean, Board Game Breakfast is so good at this point, folks, that I could just fade off the scene, I think, and it would still go great because these contributors do such a great job. Maybe I, maybe I should. Some of you would love that. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. See you tonight at my live Q&A. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.